Our God is on his throne ruling the affairs of men. God does not change. His truths have not changed. He's promised a witness in the church according to the election of grace in all ages that will stand for the old paths, defending his truth. The Primitive Baptist Digital Library is pleased to present the Word of Sovereign Grace. Timely video messages based on the King James Bible and the doctrines taught by Christ and the Apostles. Very thankful and trust tonight for the opportunity to be back here at the Spoken Mountain meeting. Uh, certainly enjoyed being here and wonderful fellowship with the church. Appreciate the hospitality. Uh, tonight I would like to speak to you from verses found in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, and verse 30. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, He that's not with me is against us, against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Now the Lord here makes a very plain and clear statement in which there really is no neutrality. There's no middle ground here. He says, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Our Lord made this statement in response to a response of the Pharisees after the Lord had healed the man. Go back to verse 22, you'll find where a blind man was brought to the Lord, one that was blind and dumb, possessed with an evil spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ healed him to where he was now able to speak and also able to see. Uh, we find that the Lord here demonstrated his power over Satan and Satan's kingdom. When our Lord was here, he came to display his power over all of his creation. He certainly displayed his power over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and the beasts of the field. He displayed his great power over the seas and over the rivers and uh, over the uh, all kind of diseases and afflictions and sicknesses, even death itself. Our Lord also came to display His great power over Satan and Satan's kingdom. Yeah. And when the Lord here cast this evil spirit out of the man, we find where there was two reactions. The people in general, they were all amazed at what they had just seen. But the Pharisees immediately, instead of rejoicing at this, the Pharisees immediately began to say, well, He cast out this devil by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Now, the people were amazed, with the exception of the Pharisees. And of course, everything the Lord does is amazing. Everything the Lord does is wonderful and miraculous. You find two expressions in the Gospels in response of, uh, in reference to response that people had. When the Lord spoke, when the Lord done things, they were amazed and they were astonished. And I still find that to be the case today. As I read the life of the Lord Jesus Christ myself in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm continually astonished, I'm continually amazed at what he has said and what he has done. The people here were very much amazed at what they had just seen, with the exception of the Pharisees. The Pharisees claimed he cast out devils by the of the prince of devils. The Lord Jesus Christ responded to show how illogical this was by telling them that every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And uh, every city uh, that is divided against itself, it cannot stand. Every city and every house. Therefore, if I cast out devils by devils above the prince of devils, who went on to tell them, then who do your children cast them out? Well, there was those among the Jews who had been blessed with God to cast out devils, so if they were going to be consistent in charge of the Lord Jesus Christ with casting out devils above the prince of devils, then he wanted to know by whom their children cast them out. And then he just went on to simply teach them once again that if Satan cast out uh, you know, this devil, then he certainly defeated himself and divided himself. All that was so illogical that he showed how ridiculous it was for them to charge that he had cast out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So then the Lord said, He that's not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. The Lord leaves no ground for neutrality here. And I believe tonight we're either for the Lord Jesus Christ or we're against him. Amen. There is no middle ground. We find this principle taught in numerous places in God's Word. And the Gospel uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 in the Sermon on the Mount the Lord Jesus Christ tells his disciples he says no man can serve two masters he says he will hate the one and despise the other or he will hold one and let go of the other now he says God can, a man cannot serve a God and man and the Lord didn't say it would be difficult to do that the Lord said you cannot do it right. man cannot serve two masters he will hate one and love the other and hold the one and despise the other Man cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. Look further on in that sermon. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the Lord said, Strive to the straight gate. For why is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many go in thereat. But stray is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and if you be there, that find it. Here are two ways. 
we either enter into the straight gate or we enter into the wide gate. Yeah. The Lord doesn't give three different ways, three different positions here, only two. Yeah. God, a man cannot serve but God and mammon. He cannot serve two masters. There is the straight and narrow gate, there is the wide and the broad gate. Now the straight and narrow gate is one that leads to life and is a life of peace and happiness and joy. Right. The wide and the broad gate leads to destruction. Right. Homes being destroyed, lives being destroyed because God's people have been influenced by the world in which they live. They've been influenced by the philosophy of this world. Right. And therefore, they're building on sand. Again, the Lord brings these two categories to our attention. And the last thing He says in Matthew 7, the Sermon on the Mount, once again. He said, I liken that man who heareth my sayings and doeth them unto a wise man, who built his house upon the rock. And when the wind blew and the rains came, his house stood because it was built upon a solid foundation upon the rock. But I like to that man who heareth my sayings and doeth them not to the foolish man. Built his house on the sand. When the rains ascended and the wind blew, his house came apart, his house fell down because he had no solid foundation. Again, we have just two categories here. Yeah. Just two. See, man is the one who invents three categories in most situations. Yeah, right. For example, the Bible says you're either rich or you're poor. But here in modern America, you're either poor, middle class, or rich. Now, the Bible says nothing about middle class. The Bible says you're either rich or you're poor. David says, I once was young and now I'm old. I'm going to see the righteous forsaken, or I see begging bread. Did you notice here that David didn't say anything about middle age? He just said you're either young or you're old. Man is the one who's come up with this middle age thing. It's man who's come up with this uh, middle class thing. But the Bible puts you in one or two categories. You're either poor or you're rich. The Lord said you shall have the poor with you always. In James chapter 2, we got a picture of two men coming to the assembly. And one is clothed in a way that reflects that he's rich and wealthy. The other reflects that he's very poor. Uh, this is the two categories James presents to us. As you study the scriptures, you'll find where you're either rich or you're poor. Now, according to the definition of poverty in this land in which we live, I'm sure many who would be classified as poor in America would be rich in other nations. Certainly those who are middle class in America would be among some of those wealthiest people in this world. So this is a third category that man has brought into the picture. Once again, man is the one who says there's a certain thing as middle age. Well, the Bible says you're either young or you're old. And you can just decide which category you want to be in tonight. Uh, you know, when I was 10, I thought 25 was old. When I was 20, I thought 40 was old. And the list goes right on and on and up, you know. You get to be 40, you think 60 is old. You get to be 60, you might think 80, 85 is old. You get to be 80, 85, you just forget about it. And so there's no such thing really as middle age. You're either young or either you are old, one of the two. And the fact of the matter is we're all getting older, regardless of how old you are tonight. The point is, we're all getting older. I wouldn't say we're getting old, but we're all getting older. So a man is the one who's brought in this third position. Out here in life, you've got conservatives on one hand, you've got liberals on the other, and in between you've got the moderates. Again, here is three different positions. Right wing, left wing, that in the middle, etc. But really, there's just basically two positions out here in life. And you're either for the Lord Jesus Christ or you're against it. Amen. That's Amen. what the Lord said here. Uh, in front of our church there in Nashville, Bethel Church, there's five lanes. And two lanes go this way, and you know, two lanes go that way, and then there's a lane in the middle. If you use the middle lane, you can uh, go in either direction. Check me real careful. They call that the suicide lane. You see? So uh, that's a lane that is kind of neutral. You get in that lane, and uh, you can go, car can go in either direction, can use that lane. You just have to be real careful when you get in that lane that the car from the other direction doesn't want to use the lane as well at the same place you want to use it. The Lord here is saying there is no neutrality. We come over to Revelation 3.14 and we find here where the Lord is going to examine the church at Laodicea. He says to the church at Laodicea, the Amen and the true and faithful witness. He says, I know thy works, thou art neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, he says, then you're in danger of being spewed out of my mouth. Yeah. He says, lukewarm is not going to cut it. He says, he'd be the hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Middle ground. There's no room for middle ground. There's no room in the Word of God for a fence track. You're either on one side or you're on the other. You know, like the man in the Civil War didn't want to choose sides. So he put on the gray shirt and the blue pants. 
So when he went out there, you know, the north shot him in the shirt, the south shot him in the pants. And so taking the middle road is not what you want. There's no room in the Word of God for a fence strap. You're either for the Lord Jesus Christ or you're against him. That's what the Lord said here. He that is not, he that's against me is not for me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. All right, that's the principle that's taught in God's Word. We read over here in the uh, book of uh, Joshua, chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. And we find where Joshua is met by this man that he does not know. And when he meets him, of course, this is a messenger from heaven here. And when he meets him, here's his question. Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Notice Joshua here does not give him the, uh, you know, the liberty of choosing the middle ground. He does not give him the liberty of being neutral here. Joshua was convinced he was either for him or he was for his adversary, and so he wanted to quickly know. Of course, God revealed to him that he was the captain of the Lord's host, and then Joshua knew exactly which side he was on. The Lord said, He that's against me is not for me. We're either for the Lord or we are against the Lord. I think every decision we make, everything that we do in life reflects that. We're either for him or we're against him. That's why we're warning the Word of God numerous times about the world in which we live. We'll take one reference, Romans 12, 2. He said, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. All right, here's the world and here's the will of God. He says, Now, we're not to be conformed to this world, the wide and the broad gate, this world here, but rather be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and that perfect and acceptable will of God. You got the way of Christ, you got the way of the world, you got the philosophy of the world, you got the counsel of the world, and then you got, of course, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the one way or the other, we're either for it or we are against it. Uh, there's no room for little ground here. Over in the book of Exodus, chapter 32, you'll find where Moses had brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea. And they're in the wilderness, and Moses got on top of the mountain. And just as soon as he's out of sight, we find the children of Israel, they began to rise up, they began to eat, drink, and be merry, and to play. When Moses and Joshua come down from the mountain, of course, we realize that these people now have turned to idolatry, find where Aaron uh, has uh, made a golden calf, and when Moses calls him on the carpet for it, of course, they're brothers, Moses calls him on the carpet for it, while Aaron begins to pass the buck, a reflection of human nature. And we find as he begins to pass the buck, he begins to blame the people for it. And he says, well, you know, they gave me this, gave me that, and I put it in the fire, and all of a sudden came out this golden cat. That sounds pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? That's because it is. And, uh, but before we get, you know, too critical here of Aaron, I'm sure we've come up with something just as preposterous, something just as ridiculous in our lifetime as Aaron did here. But anyway, come on down that chapter. You're going to find where Moses makes his statement. Who is on the Lord's side? says, come unto me. Now remember that expression, come unto me. He says, who's on the Lord's side? Come unto me. And you're going to find where the Levites came over there, where Moses was at, to show they were on the Lord's side. Who's on the Lord's side? Come over here. That was the question. Then he says, take your swords and put them on your side and go in and out of the camp and slay the people. And 3,000 were slain that was not on the Lord's side. There was the line drawn. Here's the question. Here's the statement. Come unto me, all ye that are on the Lord's side. Well, some made the decision to come over to the Lord's side. And, of course, they were on the side of victory. They were on the side of the Lord, which is always a side of victory. But here a decision was made. There was just two sides here. They were either going to be on the Lord's side or they were not. Those not on the Lord's side were destroyed. We come to 1 Kings chapter 18. And you'll find this wonderful prophet by the name of Elijah will be the central figure here. And he's going to come before the Israelites... And he's going to ask him this question. He says, how long halt you between two opinions? That's right. Yeah. How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. Now, Elijah at this time thought he was the only prophet left of God. But we see his courage, we see his strength, and we see his faith. He said, now, how long halt you between two opinions? It's time to make a decision right here. How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him. Mm -hmm. And if it's Baal, follow him. Now, Baal, of course, was the false god of the people of that day. Every nation's false god had a name. You know, the Philistines had Dagon. And, uh, you know, the Ephesians had uh, Diana. 
And you can go right on down the list of all the nations. They had false gods. They had a name for all their false gods. So he said, now, you have gone longer than you should have about this matter. How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, you follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. At that point, the people say not a word. Then Elijah says, well, I'm just one. But Baal's got 450 false prophets here. He says, tell you what we'll do. Let us both take a, a bullet and an altar. And they can put their bullet on their altar and call upon their God. And when they're finished, I'll call upon my God. And the God who answers by fire will reveal who the real God is. Now, now the people like that idea. And they all say, that's great, that's fine, that's what we'll do. And so those 450 false prophets of Baal begin first. And they begin to, you know, they put the uh, uh, bullock on the altar, and they begin to call upon their God early in the morning. And now it's about noontime, and there's been no response. That's because their God has got ears that cannot hear, eyes that cannot see, a heart that cannot feel, a heart that cannot understand, hands that cannot handle, and feet that cannot walk. Right. Amen. And therefore there cannot possibly be any response from the God that they're calling upon. That's why God says in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord, and there's none like me. I am the Lord, whom will you compare me to? All right, our God has got eyes that see, ears that hear. Mm -hmm. He's a God who has feeling and understanding. And our God is everywhere present and nowhere absent. He doesn't have to be carried anywhere by anybody, you see. Right. Amen. And so it's noontime, and there is no response. But Elijah is standing over there, watching the scene. Finally, he cannot help but just speak up and say something. He said, well, I guess your God's on a journey. I guess your God is talking. I guess your God uh, is pursuing. Or oh, maybe your God is asleep. <laughs> One of those four things must be the case because he's not responding. He's either on a journey, he's either talking, he's pursuing, or he is asleep. Now, aren't you glad that your God is never out of pocket for any of those reasons? Right. <laughs> aren't you glad that you've got a 24-7 God tonight? Amen. Aren't you glad you can call upon him 24 hours a day, seven days a week? See, my troubles don't start at 8 in the morning and at 5 in the afternoon. <laughs> my troubles may start any time during the 24-hour cycle of a day, any time of seven days a week, my problems may start. In fact, I suppose they started when I was born, and they just hadn't ended yet, and never won't until I draw my last breath. But anyway, I need the Lord 24-7. Mm -hmm. I don't need a God to call upon that might be talking, might be pursuing, might be on a journey, or he might uh, be asleep or slumbering. Our true God, living God, is not that way. Yeah. I can appreciate old Elijah for doing that. I can just visualize the scene now. The old man of God just couldn't stand it any longer. He just had to say something. But they just kept on calling into no avail. Finally, they got so angry and upset themselves, they began to just fall upon their altar, began to cut themselves, and finally it was Elijah's turn. Elijah repaired the altar, put his bullet on the altar, and then he done a little something that the other false gods didn't do. He dug a trench around the altar, and 12 barrels of water was placed upon that offering. It saturated the offering, and it filled up the trench around the altar. 12 barrels of water, and he called upon putting those 12 barrels of water when water was very, very scarce. Yeah. But now water's going to be in abundance before long. Right. The water is scarce now. And so the water now has saturated the offering. Then Elijah calls upon his God. He calls one time. That's all he needed, just one time, because his God was not talking. His God was not on a journey. His God was not asleep. His God was not pursuing. His God was on the throne where he's always been. Amen. He sits upon his throne in heaven, looks down upon this earth as his footstool, and his eyes are over the righteous, ears are open unto their cries. He sees everything going on down there. He hears the cry of that prophet Elijah, and he sends forth fire down from heaven. It consumes the offering, and it licks up the water that was in the trench. Now normally you get water and put out fire, but here fire puts out water. It's reversed. God sends fire down from heaven and it consumes the offering and then it just licks up the water that was in the trench. Now the people decide they'll make a decision. Now they can see, yes, the Lord, He is God. We will follow Him. How long halt you between two opinions, not three opinions, but two opinions, you see. Yeah. We come to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And Joshua now is in his last days. Uh, he's old and well stricken in years, but he's still just as courageous as he's ever been, still just as strong as he's ever been in the Lord. And we find that Joshua here comes to the people and he asks them the question, or makes a statement. If it seemed evil unto you this day to serve the Lord, then choose you who you will serve, whether it be the God of your fathers before the flood, or the God of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell. He said, now you just make a choice, it really doesn't matter if it seemed evil to you to serve the Lord. That wasn't evil for Joshua to serve the Lord. He didn't seem to be, think to be evil to serve the Lord. 
But apparently the way the people were behaving, that's the indication he was getting. If it seems even you this day to serve the Lord, then choose whom you will serve. It really doesn't matter. If you don't serve the Lord, it really doesn't matter who you serve out here. Right, but it right. does matter that you serve the true and living God. Right. Amen. He says you might as well serve the God of your father before the flood or the God of the Amorites whose land you dwell. It really wouldn't matter because one is just as ineffective as the other. Right. Uh, one is no uh, you know, better to you than the other is. So choose you this day whom you shall serve. But as for me and my house... We shall serve the Lord. Right. Now notice there is no neutral position here. Mm -hmm. You either serve the Lord or you don't serve the Lord. You either follow the Lord or you don't follow the Lord. You either come to the Lord or you don't come to the Lord, you see. There is no middle ground, no neutral position here. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, He that's against me is not for me. And He says, He that gathereth not with me, then scattereth abroad. All right, how long haunt you between two opinions? Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Come on to me, those who are on the Lord's side. Josh said, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? This is the principle taught throughout God's Word that there's no neutral ground here. I'd say tonight, as God's children, we're either following the Lord Jesus Christ and we're with Him or we're against Him one way or the other. Now we come over here to the 10th chapter of the book of Mark and there is a man who comes to the Lord with a question. And he says to the Lord, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I'm not going to go through the details of that conversation tonight. But you can read the details of that conversation, seeing how the Lord answered this man according to divine wisdom. And he's going to tell that man to keep the commandments and thou shalt live. And he said, well, I've kept them all from my youth up. The Lord names five out of the last six of the Ten Commandments and omits one on purpose because the Lord knew this man's heart. He knew this man's problem right here. And he says, well, you lack one thing. And I imagine this man at this point thought, well, I don't know what he's going to say. I'm sure I've kept it too. He said, well, you lack one thing. Go and sell what thou hast and give to the poor. And come and follow me, and ye shall have treasure in heaven. All right, this man, and before the Lord told him this, in Mark chapter 10, you'll find this expression, and the Lord loved him. Yeah. The Lord loved this man right here. What does that tell me? That tells me this man here is a covenant child. Yeah. This tells me this is a child of grace, a child of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. This tells me he's one of God's children, belongs to the family of God. Anybody whom Jesus loves belongs to his family. Amen. And anybody who loves Jesus belongs to his family. Amen. See, the doctrine of grace has got it right in both accounts here. Anybody, everybody's going to be in heaven someday. It's going to be somebody who loved the Lord here in this lifetime. I can tell you that. And they'll love the Lord because the Lord put His love within their hearts. They will know Him inwardly. They also know Him, the least of them, to the greatest of them. Regardless of where they may be, around this globe, east, uh, west, north, or south. Here's a man that Jesus Christ loved. But the Lord knew He had a problem. God's people have problems. And the Lord knows what those problems are. Here's one of His children with a problem. He has great riches, but the riches have Him. Mm -hmm. He has great possessions, but possessions have Him. This man went away very sad. Because he had great riches, great possessions, he went away very, very sad. Here's a child of God who did not stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's one who's not on the Lord's side at this point. Here's one who turned and walked the other way. In John chapter 6, you'll find where the Lord Jesus Christ had been feeding the multitudes. The Lord Jesus Christ had appointed the miracles and the multitudes began to increase. There were thousands there on that occasion. But then the Lord began to preach. And uh, that began to diminish the crowd. It's kind of amazing about that, isn't it? How you can talk about sports, how you can talk about politics, talk about the things of this world at work, and you can get a pretty good crowd around there. But you start talking about your church service last Sunday, start talking about what a wonderful sermon your pastor preached last Sunday, or ask a Bible question, and all of a sudden people have places to go. And so they begin to diminish, the crowd begin to get smaller, and we finally find one of the saddest verses in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. And first of all, they said, this is a hard saying, who shall know it? And then he said, from that point on, many of his disciples followed him no more. Mm -hmm. They turned and walked with him no more. It said in my heart to know tonight, as I look out on this congregation, I might look in the face of somebody that a few months from now, a few weeks from now, might turn the other way and would follow him no more. I hope that I can follow him until I draw my last breath in this world. Amen. But sometimes God's people do not follow him. Right. In 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, Demon hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Why he had forsaken Paul? Because he loved this present world. 
God's people can love this world in which we live here, or the Apostle John would not have told us to love not the world. God's people be friendly with this world right here, more than they ought to be, or James would not have said, be not friends with the world. God's people can conform themselves to this world if they're not careful. That's why Paul said in Romans 12, too, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that again you might prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Right. All right, here's a rich young ruler who has three things the world said, if you've got, then you're in great shape. You got youth, and you got riches, and you got power or authority. Here's a ruler, he's got a part of power and authority, and he's rich, he's got wealth. And he's got youth. Now, he may, make, may have been able to maintain his wealth. He might have been able to maintain his power, but I can assure you he would not maintain his youth. There would come a time when he would go from the category of being young to the category of being old. I can assure you that. That's one thing we cannot maintain regardless of the beauticians, regardless of the billion dollar industry in cosmetics. It's not going to stop the aging process. Just trust me, it is not going to do that. You know, it's amazing how some people, when they're real young, want to look old, and when they get old, they want to look young, just not ever satisfied with what they are, whatever they are. Now, we find this man here has three things. Uh, the world says, if you've got, then you are in good shape. But he's not in good shape because he did not sell what he had. He did not give it to the poor. He did not follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He was against the Lord in that regard, you see. Come over to Acts chapter 26. There's a man up here in the name of Griff. He's a king. Here's another man with power. Here's another man with authority. Here's another man with wealth. Here's another man with recognition. And the Apostle Paul comes before him and makes some very interesting statements. The Apostle Paul said, I'm glad to come before you, Agrippa, because I consider you to be an expert in all the Jewish customs. Well, that's one thing. But then he says something else. He says, Believest thou the prophets, Agrippa? He said, I know thou believest. Now, if Agrippa believed the prophets, who did the prophets talk about? The prophets talked about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The prophets prophesied about his birth, about his life, about his sufferings, about his crucifixion, about his death, about his resurrection, about his victory, about his reign, about his kingdom. They prophesied all those things in the Old Testament day. And the Apostle Paul says to Agrippa, all, he says to Agrippa, I know that thou believest the prophets. If Agrippa believes the prophets, based upon 1 John 5, 1, when John says, Whoso believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, I'm going to take position tonight that King Agrippa was a child of God. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> that Agrippa was a child of God. Amen. But now you've got Agrippa sitting upon that throne with his royal apparel, all his money, all his wealth, all his recognition, all his power and everything else, and there's the Apostle Paul before him, probably not a cent in his pocket, and with the marks on his body of his sufferings and his persecutions, and his garments no doubt were torn and, and uh, everything else, and here the king of the rep, after hearing the apostle Paul makes this statement, almost thou persuades me to be a Christian. Not a child of God, but a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Our Lord said, he does not with me, is against me. Yeah. King Agrippa here takes a stand, the wrong, makes the wrong decision, he's not going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 18, our Savior is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and a band of uh, soldiers come to get him, led by a man named Judas Iscariot. And when they come there, the Lord asks the question, Whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And the Bible says, He that betrayed him, Judas Iscariot, stood with them. Stood with who? Stood with the enemy. He stood with the people he belonged to. He stood with the enemy. He that's not with me is against me. Judas' character proved he was not with the Lord Jesus Christ and proved he was against him, you see. All right, I'm going to wrap my message up tonight by going back to those three examples of the Old Testament. Three things we'll notice here. In Exodus chapter 32, Moses said, Who's on the Lord's side? Come unto me. That order to remind you of our Lord's words in Matthew chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and have your labor. And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're going to be on the Lord's side, you've got to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in gospel obedience. If you're going to be on the Lord's side, then deny yourself, take up your cross, come on in through water baptism, and uh, identify yourself with the family of Christ, identify yourself with Jesus Christ himself, and in doing that, you obtain rest unto your soul. Mm -hmm. All right, Elijah says, How long haunt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Our Lord was constantly telling those to follow Him. Again, in Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler, what did the Lord say? Go and sell what thou hast to give to the poor and come and follow me. 
Amen. In John 21, the Lord Jesus Christ tells the Apostle Peter, follow me. That doesn't take a, a whole lot of education to understand those two words. Follow me. Pretty simple, is it not? Follow me. That's what the gospel's all about. It's the good news and glad tidings of God's children in this world. And the gospel says, come and follow the Lord Jesus Christ in gospel baptism. Follow him in the pathway of discipleship. Follow him in the way of Christianity. And in so doing, you will be for him and not against him. Right. right. And then Joshua says in Joshua chapter 24, As for me and my house, we shall what? Serve the Lord. Here are the three things the Lord's people ought to be involved in. Come into the Lord Jesus Christ to obtain rest and learning of Him and serving Him and following Him. Those three things go together. Amen. Our Lord said, He that's against me is not for me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Where do we stand tonight individually? I believe as a people we are on the Lord's side. And I will close out with this tonight in John 21 after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter says, I go a fishing. At this point, he's on the other side. Mm -hmm. He just switched sides. God's people can do that, you know. He just switched sides. And they toiled that night and caught nothing. Right. And then the Lord appears on the scene. The Lord said, now catch a net on the right side. And I said, that right from left or right from wrong? Well, I think it's right from wrong. It probably is right from left. And I know it's right from wrong. Apparently, they've been fishing on the wrong side all night. They ain't caught anything. But when you follow the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're always on the right side. That's right. And the Lord said, cast your net on the right side. And when they did, why well, they caught more fish than they could handle. And now they got on the Lord's side, you see. When you're on the Lord's side, expect prosperity. When you're on the Lord's side, expect blessings. When you're not on the Lord's side, expect chastisement, expect judgment. Expect things to go the wrong, go the other way, you see. So we're either for the Lord or we're against the Lord. Yeah. I want to be for the Lord tonight. Amen. I want to stand up under the banner of King Jesus, under the banner of truth tonight, of God's sovereign grace. I want to stand for the Lord concerning His person, stand for the Lord concerning His work, stand for the Lord concerning all His teaching in this world. I want to be on the Lord's side. If I'm on the Lord's side, I'll let all the enemy come. I believe I can stand like David did if I'm on the Lord's side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whose side are you on tonight? Yes. The Lord said, He that's not for me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Amen. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Visit the Primitive Baptist Digital Library for videos, articles, history, hymns, and encouragement. www.primitivebaptist.net